you so much for welcoming me here today. As you heard, I'm not a Stone Ridge alum, and I'm not a Stone Ridge girl, but my daughters are, and Emma's in the audience, and my first graders at home listening to this slide. Um, I'm very honored to be here to tell you not about my mission, not about my story, but about the story of a child and his family. Um, science is power, um, science is knowledge, and his family accepted a journey or mission that was not their choice. They did not plan to take this mission, they did not plan to take this journey, but they took it to help one great little boy, devote to his parents, but last they to us today. He wasn't trying to walk. 
His toes were curling when he was standing. He was frustrated. He was annoyed by it. And he looked uncomfortable. So my son's parents said, what you would do if you had a kid where something wasn't quite right? They took him to his doctor's. And they went to the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And there, they saw a therapist. And the therapist called a the doctor. And the doctor sent them to the emergency room. And the emergency room admitted them. And so far, things seemed OK. The doctor seemed to have a good and you know, under control. They were telling them, we're going to do this test. We're going to do this next. And you know, the first night turned into a day. And he had an MRI. And they started hearing all sorts of words. Words they weren't familiar with that they'd never heard of before. And then they heard a really scary word, the word leukodystrophy. Now, the word leukodystrophy is something most of you have never heard of before, and hopefully most of you won't. But the fact that nobody ever hears about this word means that when families are diagnosed with these conditions, instead of going home to a community where sick people say, oh, I know what you have. I know what you're going to face. I know your child is going to be in the hospital and your child's going to be sick. They're left completely alone. So this family made it, it partly their mission to educate people. So leukodystrophy, what does that word mean? Leuko is Greek for white. Dis is Greek for lacto. And troph is Greek for, for growth. So leukodystrophy means no growth of white matter, no growth of myelin. So what does the myelin do? Your brain is a series of electrical wires. That's really, for a neurologist, all it is. It's a lot more for a lot of people, as we've seen in this room. But for me, that's basically what it does. <laughs> the myelin um, the myelin is basically the insulation around those wires. It makes everything that we've seen people here do today, the music, the thinking, the compassion, is what makes all that possible. But it also makes things possible, like learning to walk and talk. So without myelin, you can't do those things. So most patients who have leukodystrophies never get a specific diagnosis. And just like most patients, Massimo's, from Massimo's doctors didn't know what he had. They sent lots of tests. They told the parents it's going to take time. And they sent his, his information to a doctor in the Netherlands, Mario Van Lachna. She had never seen anything like it, even though she's seen thousands of children with leukodystrophy. We put him through a big algorithm and came up empty-handed. 306 days later, the family still had no answer. Meanwhile, Matthew was getting worse. He can't even sit up anymore. And he is losing most of everything that he could do before. And the parents are worried he's not going to make it through the coming year. So Matthew was in this condition that over half the patients with lupus are in, unclassified leukodystrophy. And if you think about it, it's pretty bad having an enemy from within, having a genetic disease where you know, you're being robbed of things you could do before. But if you don't even know what it is, you don't even know who to begin fighting. And that's the situation Massimo's family was in. Now it turns out, Massimo's dad is not an ordinary dad. He's not a doctor, he's not a scientist, but he's pretty extraordinary. Years before, he'd been stuck on an airplane, like we all are, and he'd been stuck with whatever was in that front pocket of the airline um, seat. And this was in that front seat of the airline. This was um, the scientist who did um, the work across the street at NHGRI, where they looked at the first human genome. And they started really the project of sequencing and understanding our genes. And when Massimo's dad was in the situation where his child had no known diagnosis, he said, it's in the genes. Come on, figure this out. These doctors have done this before. We can do this again, right? It can't be that hard. supercomputer, right? And then land the universe, everything he has rubs out the other end. How hard could it be? <laughs> right? Well, it turns out not so easy, right? Your DNA is huge. 44 times you can stretch around the earth, Massimo's dad learned. And they were looking for probably two small changes. How are they going to do that? So, just, just recently, um, just at that time, Illumina, a company in California, started actually sequencing human genes. And they can put up on their website, you know, anybody wants their genome done, just call us. So my husband's dad called them. This is how he, this is how he uh, recalls a conversation. Hi, I'm not supposed to I'd like to do my genome for my family. What? You want to do what? Yeah, it's on your website. Yes. Could you put you on hold for a moment? Anyways, lots of phone calls later, and Massimo's DNA was on its way to California. 
It ran through a supercomputer, just like in the book. And meanwhile, that's in the story was trying to attract real attention. Because I think the important thing to know is pretty much nobody had done this before. The potential was there, but nobody had done it. And a couple months later, the dad had this hard drive on his desk, right? And he's like, okay, but now I like to write. <laughs> because literally, he had more than 12,000 variants and more than almost 6,000 genes. So what next? So, back to the supercomputer concept. How hard can it really be? <laughs> it turns out, his pediatrician's best friend's husband <laughs> sometimes happened to be somebody who crunched numbers like this for a living. And the pediatrician knew all about what Massimo's dad was trying to do. And she said to her friend, hey, doesn't your husband do something in DNA? Can you help us out? So Massimo's dad called his friend. And they looked at the numbers, and they actually found a gene. But Matthew was just one child. You can't prove a giant disease with just one child. So we have a project where we collect lots of different kids and lots of genetic information on kids with good dystrophy. We had another family, a lot like Matthew's family. And through the efforts of the different scientists and mainly Matthew's family, it turns out that there were lots of kids with the same disease. Mm -hmm. So we published a paper, and more papers were published. And one important thing is that some of the kids have been misdiagnosed with sclerosis and were treated with steroids. They got better. A little bit better, not a lot, but a little bit better. Last thing was treated with the steroid, and within 72 hours, he pulled the steam for the first time. Mm -hmm. And just as important, Massimo was alone anymore. And Massimo's parents weren't alone. And those other parents who didn't have answers, and those other kids who didn't have answers, also had answers. So some people have called this the Massimo effect. <laughs> and not only has the Massimo effect led to finding other kids with the same disease, but this dad now has gone on, you know, not, not to stop at finding your disease as a you know, non-physician, non-scientist, but this data actually has created a huge group of researchers who are now working at developing animal models and working really to understand what the disease does and what potential real treatments there may be. And so, for a little bit, thanks to this family, I got not to wear this. So for a little bit, I get to wear this. Uh -huh. And I get to be part of Mission Maxima. And I get to be part of something that's bigger than just the science that an individual person can do in a lab or in an individual clinic. And these are Maxima's brothers saying, mission accomplished. <laughs> so if we go back to 2012 on that day when I was so discouraged in my clinic, I didn't know yet. I knew we had found the gene. I didn't know yet everything that Maxima was absolutely able to do with that gene. Okay? But that plaque was an antidote to the fact that at the time, I just didn't know, just because I had a diagnosis didn't mean I had treatment, and didn't mean I had something to offer the family. And so on that day, I took some time out of my clinic, took a hammer and a nail out, put that plaque on my wall, and then I went back to clinic. So I'd like to thank the Massimo Foundation for providing an example for what one family can do, and what one family can believe in a plan, mission accomplished. And to also say that the beginning of, you know, usually mission accomplished means there's more work yet to be done. And so we make our work to try to solve and cure the Thank you very much.